The biggest appeal of the website Kickstarter is its potential to resurrect inactive genres. One of said genres is a collectathon platformer, at one point these games were considered system sellers. Games such as Mario 64, Spyro the Dragon and so many more. However, after the sixth generation of consoles, PS2, GameCube and Xbox, said genre took a backseat to the console shooter. At the height of the genre's popularity, one of the most consistent developers was Rareware, with its classics such as Donkey Kong Country and Banjo-Kazooie, with the former being the inspiration for the Kickstarter. The company catapulted itself into success, creating games full of whimsical charm, enticing gameplay and lots of googly eyes. In 2015, former Rare employees formed a studio called Playtonic Games before coming together to launch a Kickstarter project. Said project was used to fund ukulele to the tune of £2,090,104. Needless to say, the campaign was incredibly successful. For the interest of disclosure, I did donate to the game, to take that into consideration. As the name suggests, this game is a spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie. So, does this game manage to live up to its predecessors? Let's find out. The story is rather simple. Laylee, the bat, has her book stolen from the greedy capital B, a villain who may or may not represent their former publisher, Microsoft. True to form, the story is simple, and really does the story need to be anything more? Games like this don't really need a deep, complex lore. She's part of the darkness now. She doesn't need the light. You're a nobody! Is a faithful recreation of the events in question. Oh, it lands me, lads. I mean, oh, love that plonker capital B, Nick Maori Pie in it. Oh my god, this is terrible. Let's go, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory Pro. Oh, this is awful. Kill mouse. Clearly a lot of work went into the dialogue, as well as the ridiculous names coated in puns. A lot of the humour revolves around references to previous games and developers' catalogue, as well as spoofing modern video game tropes. Obviously, humour is one of the most subjective concepts, but I did find myself smirking and having a sensible chuckle. Even the signature Banjo-Kazooie grunts are used in place of spoken dialogue were humorous at times. <coughs> Okay, sorry, I can't tackle this game in my usual format of breaking this game down into parts and, you know, being positive and all that guff. I'm just going to let you know right away, I did have fun with this game, however, there are many problems with it that just, just, just add up. For instance, this game just can't seem to decide what it wants to be. Even early on in the Kickstarter, they showed off many concepts and features that were just not part of Banjo-Kazooie. For example, Look at the Kartos minigames. Yes, I am very much aware that these are a throwback to Donkey Kong Country, but does this really have a place in a Banjo-Kazooie homage? Why not just give him a gun? Oh yeah, do you guys remember Goldeneye? Right? What's worse is that a lot of these minigames are just some of the worst parts of the game. Rextro? More like... Rextro? More like... No? The first retro minigame caused me to have an existential crisis. I pick up the speed boost. I lose. I don't pick up the speed boost. I lose. How do I not lose? Controlling this is only slightly better than pushing a shopping trolley up a hill while wearing ice skates. And getting the power up that jumbles your controls only makes it slightly worse. Throughout the game you collect quills and don't worry we'll get to the quills in just a bit. But you collect them to gain new abilities. Pretty cool right? But some of these abilities just raise so many questions. Like, why is the super roll and scream so inconsistent? The game doesn't tell you which one is needed for which puzzle. You are told that both break glass, but only certain glass can be broken with the roll, and same can be said for the super scream. You are never shown the difference between this glass and this glass. Also, the screen breaks ice underwater once. Amazing. So, am I just terrible, or did they not explain that the Go Invisible power-up also manipulates lasers? I don't think I was ever told this. Also, yes, in hindsight, I guess it makes sense because you're reflective and blah 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 blah, but then why not after me getting the power, put me in a situation where I have no choice but to notice this? Here's how I would have done it. Maybe have a spotlight where you find Mr. Trouser Snake, so when you test out your new ability, you notice you're able to direct light with said ability. One last thing about the abilities I just don't like is this flying ability right right here. Not only is this game breaking, because why jump when you can fly? Just look at how close up the camera is. You cannot begin to understand how hard it is to control due to your vision being obscured. You're just like, please, just, just let me, please, just let me see. Uh Okay, look, I lied about that being one last point. Why do the power-ups that you pick up not have a timer? Why Why do you have a stamina meter for when you roll and whatnot, but no meter or timer for the fire or bomb pickups? Why would you do this, Platonic, especially when this is in your game? Oh, great. Now I'm stuck here forever. Well, at least until I run out of stamina and then die. Good. Good. I'm Michael Jordan. Help. Michael Jordan. Help. Help. 
about those quills. In my last video, please go check it out if you haven't, I talked about accessibility in games. I felt the best way to get new players interested in your game is to have level design that teaches players. Now, these levels are rather large and I had many complaints about people getting lost. I never did for whatever reason, but I can see why people struggle to find their way. Now, in free roaming 3D platformers, like the games this title takes its cues from, the box down in common collectibles, be it quills, musical notes, coins, rings, and so on. These are very useful tools to guide the player. They can help point players towards points of interest or show them where they have been or have not been. They are very good at tapping into players' curiosity. So what on earth is this? They shouldn't be this hard to find, especially when there are 200 of these blasted things in each level. What are you doing? On the subject of being obscure, any aspiring game designers, please take note of this. Do not, I repeat, do not introduce a power-up in the final level of the game and hide some power-up. So, I'm in this tunnel, in the space level, where you have to use pretty much every single power-up in order to get through these tunnels. It looks easy, use this combination here and here and... Wait a second, what is this platform? This is the first time I've ever seen this. Uh, there is a thunderbolt, but I don't have any kind of electric power. What is this? I've never seen this before. Okay, we, we need to quickly move on, so I'm just going to quick fire everything else that annoys me in this game. All the bosses are terrible, minus the final one. Mess up once and this guy gets a bunch of free hits. I don't like the ice level, at all. These massive worlds have so much empty space. These worlds hardly change, making them feel lifeless. These worlds don't seem to make any sense in terms of the progression. You go from a jungle, to ice world, to a forest, best level by the way, casino, and then into outer space. Yay, jump through rings over and over again. Work in Superman 64. The rolling is too sensitive at times. Some of the transformations are just pointless. Shovel Knight just appears out of nowhere. Uh, I don't understand. Uh, and I hate Rexstrom. Oh no. Is that it? I I think I think that I think that's all of it. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're thinking. I did mention I had fun with this game. You have just the right amount of speed and Yuka feels responsive when running and jumping. I get a great deal of satisfaction collecting collectibles, mostly because the sound design is on point and it just feels good to pick stuff up. You also don't stop in place when collecting a pagey, like in most games in this genre, so as not to interrupt the flow. I also like how each ghost writer you have to collect has its own gimmick, like for example the one you have to chase in this guy right here. Absolute legend. Expanding the world while poorly executed because why would I not want to expand the world right away is an interesting concept and I don't think it's ever been done in these kinds of games. It could have fixed the issue I mentioned earlier about the worlds not really changing making you feel like you have less of an impact. The soundtrack is wonderful with some of David Wise's best work, but would I recommend this to someone? I don't know. Really I don't. Maybe if you're a fan of the genre, but even then I would still advise on waiting for a potential sale in the future. With Mario Odyssey on the horizon I feel like this game just might end up being forgotten. Also you can't skip cutscenes, bye.